Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson. This program is aimed at English learners, so we speak a little slower and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the program, you will hear from Jill Robbins and Anna Mateo. Later, Steve Ember will present our American history series, The Making of a Nation. But first... Want to see Chance the Rapper play jokes on Hollywood stars? Enjoy a new action movie starring Liam Hemsworth and Christoph Waltz? Or would you like to watch a six-minute version of the American news show, 60 Minutes. Well, there is an app for all that and more. Quibi, a combination of the words quick and bite, is for mobile phone use only. The streaming service will release short parts of movies and TV shows each weekday. And every day, Quibi will provide news, sports, and weather programming under the name Daily Essentials. In all, the app plans to offer more than 175 programs this year. Quibi launched Monday in the United States and Canada with a 90-day free trial and 50 programs. The programs are no longer than 10 minutes each. They include Punked with Chance the Rapper, the Hemsworth Vaults movie Most Dangerous Game, and Chrissy's Court, with model Chrissy Teigen serving as judge of small claims cases. Others who have signed on to either produce or appear in Quibi content include stars Reese Witherspoon, Joe Jonas, Jennifer Lopez, Lena Waithe, and Sophie Turner. The former head of Walt Disney Studios and DreamWorks Animation, Jeffrey Katzenberg, established Quibi. He named former Hewlett-Packard leader Meg Whitman as the chief of the new streaming company. Whitman also served in leadership positions at Disney and DreamWorks. For Katzenberg, it is the product that will make Quibi a winner. In all my years, there is one rule that has never failed, ever, he said. When I had my hands on great content, whether it was an animation and movies, anything that I had ever had in my orbit that was really good, it's never not worked. Quibi raised $1 billion in 2018 from investors including Disney, NBC Universal, and Viacom, and announced it won another $750 million in a second money-raising effort that closed earlier this month. The company announced the free 90-day trial period in reaction to the coronavirus crisis. After that, Quibi will cost between about $5 to $7 a month, depending on the version users choose. The company increased production over concern about a possible writer's strike last summer. Katzenberg said as a result, it got programming done ahead of the COVID-19 shutdown of television and film production. Quibi is set for new releases through October or November under current conditions. The company enters a marketplace crowded with new and existing streamers, including the future HBO Max. And then there is YouTube, a streamer filled with free short-form programs and an already loyal young adult fan base.
Tiffany Pinckney remembers the fear she felt when the coronavirus she suffered from made it very difficult to breathe. So, when she recovered, the New York City woman became one of the country's first survivors to donate her blood. That blood may now help other seriously ill patients. Pinckney told the Associated Press, It was overwhelming to know that in my blood there may be answers. Doctors around the world are reusing a treatment for infections that is about 100 years old, giving blood plasma from recovered patients to sick ones. Plasma is the yellowish liquid part of blood. The blood from former patients is filled with immune molecules that can help survivors defeat COVID-19, the disease caused by the coronavirus. Such donations have already been made by recovered patients in Houston and New York. Now, hospitals and blood centers in other areas are preparing for possibly hundreds of survivors to donate. Doctors do not know if the treatments will be successful. This is a call to action, said Dr. David Reich. He is president of New York's Mount Sinai Hospital, which collected Tiffany Pinckney's blood. People feel very helpless in the face of this disease. And this is one thing that people can do to help their fellow human beings, he added. The treatment was used during the 1918 flu pandemic. It was also used to fight several other infections before modern medicine found new antiviral drugs. During an infection, the body starts making antibodies designed to attack the germ that has invaded the body. These antibodies stay for months or years in the blood plasma of survivors. This treatment can be used while scientists search for a vaccine or a new drug. It is a temporary measure that can be put into place quickly, said Dr. Jeffrey Henderson. He is from Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. He is putting together a study about the treatment. This is not a cure, but rather it is a way to reduce the severity of illness, Henderson said. Doctors don't know how long survivors' antibodies will stay in their plasma. Last week, the Food and Drug Administration told hospitals how to request emergency permission to use the treatment. Houston Methodist Hospital and Mount Sinai both asked immediately. The public also answered requests from hospitals for donations. Michigan State University had more than 1,000 people sign up for the National COVID-19 Convalescent Plasma Project. The group was formed by hospitals hoping to increase plasma donation for research. Survivors who want to donate blood cannot just walk into a blood center. They must prove the virus is gone and that they have been free of symptoms for several weeks. They also must have a high level of antibodies in their blood. Chinese doctors reported last week that five people treated with plasma from former patients all began to improve a week later. But they also received other treatments, so there is no way to know if the plasma caused the improvements. In a North Carolina factory, Spanish chemical company Grifols is trying to recreate a version of donor plasma that is filled with a large amount of antibodies. Researchers at the National Institutes of Health are measuring survivors' antibody levels to learn how strong a vaccine must be. Other scientists, including some at Beijing's Tsinghua University, are trying to find out which antibodies are the strongest. 
they hope to copy those antibodies in a lab and create a drug treatment. But donations from people like Pinckney could be used as fast as medical centers can process the blood. When Mount Sinai asked her to donate, she agreed immediately. It's hope for someone else, she said. From VOA Learning English, this is the Health and Lifestyle Report. The world is experiencing a major health crisis. As the new coronavirus spreads, many countries are limiting their citizens' activities. Travel has been restricted. Many schools are closed. In major cities around the world, restaurants and other businesses are shut down. Public emergencies bring out a certain type of person, the panic shopper. Some people fear not being able to find basic needs for survival. So they buy everything off supermarket shelves in preparation for the days to come. Bread is often among the first products to disappear in emergency situations. So if you have never made bread, now may be a good time to learn. Bread making is a survival skill. With very few simple things, such as flour, salt, and yeast, you can bake a fresh loaf of bread for your family, neighbors, or co-workers. Baking is not just a useful survival skill. It can make you feel better at stressful times. In fact, baking and cooking have been used to treat people with mental health issues. Julie Ohana is a social worker. She offers what she calls culinary therapy to her patients in New York City. I say therapy because to me cooking is so therapeutic. And therapeutic really means something that makes you feel good, something that that is helpful and beneficial to the person doing it. Julie Ohana uses culinary therapy to help people overcome many kinds of issues. She explains that culinary therapy works on many levels. So when you're in the kitchen, whether you're cooking or you're baking, it really requires a certain level of mindfulness, of being present in the moment. Specifically when you're baking, and baking really requires step-by-step following a recipe, Uh, being more precise, kneading the dough or rolling something out, you really, you really get the full benefit of being present in the moment and being able to relax and put aside all the other thoughts and just, you know, focus on the here and now. And there really are very strong benefits of being able to do that, to be able to relax, to to decompress, de-stress, and really increase one's level of life satisfaction. Ohana says baking is a process filled with love. It not only makes you feel good, it produces something tangible, something you can touch and eat. Ohana calls baking a labor of love. And when you bake, you go through this whole process and it really is a labor of love and you end up with the finished product that not only is it tangible, but it's edible and it's delicious. Often our food experiences are tied to family memories and stories. We remember meals our grandmothers made. We teach our children important recipes for family favorites. Ohana says something that all bakers know. Giving delicious baked goods makes the giver feel as good as the receiver. So she calls baking a win-win. To be able to pass that on to someone else certainly can make the day for the person receiving it, but it's also just as powerful for the person who's giving the baked goods. The win-win, it's not just something purely that you do for the other person. The baker, the cook, really gets to benefit from the act as well. And that's the Health and Lifestyle Report. I'm Ana Mateo.
Welcome to the Making of a Nation, American History in VOA Special English. We begin the story of President Lyndon Johnson. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Lyndon Baines Johnson became America's 36th president suddenly. Vice President Lyndon Johnson has left the hospital in uh, Dallas. Uh, presumably, he will be taking the oath of office shortly and become uh, the 36th president of the United States. On November 22, 1963, President John F. Kennedy was murdered. Kennedy and Johnson, his vice president, were in Dallas, Texas. Kennedy was shot as his open car drove through the city. Within a few hours, Johnson was sworn into office. The swearing-in took place on the presidential plane, Air Force One, at Dallas's Love Field. The plane returned to Andrews Air Force Base near Washington, carrying the new president and the body of the former president. At Andrews, President Johnson read a brief statement. He ended with these words, I will do my best. That is all I can do. I ask for your help and God's. Before he was vice president, LBJ had served for many years in the Senate and the House of Representatives. He grew up in small towns in Texas. He finished high school at age 15. He traveled and worked for a few years before he entered Southwest Texas State Teachers College. There, he was a student leader and a political activist. In 1931, a newly elected congressman asked Johnson to work for him as his secretary in Washington. Four years later, President Franklin Roosevelt appointed Johnson as Texas director of Roosevelt's National Youth Administration. Two years after that, in 1937, Johnson won a special election for a seat in the House of Representatives. He served in the House for 12 years. When the United States entered World War II, Johnson was the first member of Congress at that time to volunteer for active duty. After the war, he ran for the Senate, where he also served for 12 years. Johnson loved politics and became an expert in the operations of government. He would need all of that knowledge as president of a nation facing problems near and far. When Johnson took office, communist forces were fighting South Vietnamese troops supported by the United States. Also, there were continuing worries about nuclear war with the Soviet Union. At home, there was racial conflict. Many Americans were out of work, and there was the threat of a railroad strike. Johnson began his presidency by working hard for legislation that President Kennedy had proposed. Johnson had voted against civil rights legislation when he served in the Senate, but now he urged Congress to support the idea and Congress agreed. The 1964 Civil Rights Act barred discrimination against minorities in jobs and in restaurants and other businesses. We believe that all men are created equal, yet many are denied equal treatment. We believe that all men have certain unalienable rights, Yet many Americans do not enjoy those rights. We believe that all men are entitled to the blessings of liberty. 
yet millions are being deprived of those blessings. Not because of their own failures, but because of the color of their skin. The president said that such a situation could not continue in America. To treat people unfairly because of their race, he said, violated the Constitution and the idea of democracy. Lyndon Johnson succeeded in getting Congress to pass more civil rights legislation in 1965 and 68. Many of the issues of civil rights are very complex and most difficult. But about this, there can and should be no argument. Every American citizen must have an equal right to vote. There is no reason which can excuse the denial of that right. There is no duty which weighs more heavily on us than the duty we have to ensure that right. Many southern states used so-called literacy tests as a way to deny blacks the right to vote. The Negro citizen may go to register only to be told that the day is wrong, or the hour is late, or the official in charge is absent. And if he persists, and if he manages to present himself to the registrar, he may be disqualified because he did not spell out his middle name or because he abbreviated a word on the application. And if he manages to fill out an application, he is given a test. The registrar is the sole judge of whether he passes this test. He may be asked to recite the entire Constitution or explain the most complex provisions of state law and even a college degree cannot be used to prove that he can read and write. The Civil Rights Act of 1965 said states could not prevent citizens from voting just because they could not read very well. The 1968 law barred discrimination against blacks in housing. Johnson was from the South. That, and his ability to persuade people, helped him get Southern conservatives in Congress to support the civil rights legislation. He also had other ideas for a better America. He called his plan the Great Society. He talked about it in a speech at the University of Michigan. The Great Society rests on abundance and liberty for all. It demands an end to poverty and racial injustice, to which we're totally committed in our time. But that is just the beginning. The Great Society is a place where every child can find knowledge to enrich his mind and to enlarge his talents. Johnson launched the War on Poverty, a series of bills designed to help the poor. But his efforts to pay for social programs and a war overseas led to inflation. Vietnam was not the only place where Johnson used military force. In 1965, he sent more than 20,000 troops to intervene in the Dominican Republic. He worried that a revolution could lead to a communist takeover of that Caribbean nation. <music> Lyndon Johnson served the last 14 months of President Kennedy's term. Then, in 1964, he ran for a full term. The Democratic Party strongly supported him and accepted his choice of Hubert Humphrey for vice president. Humphrey was a liberal senator from the state of Minnesota.
Unlike the Democrats, the Republicans had a difficult time choosing their presidential candidate. Delegates at the party's nominating convention finally chose Barry Goldwater. Goldwater was a strongly conservative senator from Arizona. Certainly simple honesty is not too much to demand of men in government. And let our republicanism so focused and so dedicated not be made fuzzy and futile by unthinking and stupid labels. I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. And let me remind you also that moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. The Republican candidate for vice president was William Miller, a congressman from New York State. Americans voted in November of 1964. Lyndon Johnson won more than 60% of the popular vote. Still, he had hoped for an even bigger victory. He wanted proof that Americans were voting for him and not the shadow of John Kennedy. In his inaugural speech, Johnson said his great society would never be finished. It would keep growing and improving. I do not believe that the great society is the ordered, changeless, and sterile battalion of the ants. It is the excitement of becoming, always becoming, trying, probing, falling, resting, and trying again, but always trying and always gaining. In 1965, he won congressional approval of Medicare, a health insurance program for Americans age 65 and older. President Harry Truman had called for such a plan 20 years earlier. Johnson presented Truman and his wife, Bess, with Medicare cards numbers one and two. Under Johnson, Congress also approved Medicaid, a health care program for the poor and disabled. In 1967, President Johnson appointed the nation's first black justice to the Supreme Court, Thurgood Marshall. Around the country, President Johnson faced growing opposition to the war in Vietnam. More and more American troops were dying. Lyndon Johnson may have wanted to be remembered as a great president, but the war came to redefine his presidency. And that's our program for today. Listen again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Jonathan Evans. And I'm Ashley Thompson.